We met in church. That's why I remember falling in love for the first time on a Sunday. No, it wasn't a crush or that silly rush of emotions that make young people do crazy things. This was deep and sweet. It was the real deal. I was broke, she wasn't. She was born again, I wasn't. Her parents were people of substance, mine weren't. Damn, they couldn't even spell the word. They probably didn't even know the word. She had everything. I had nothing except my university degree and a stubborn belief that I'd be something, that I'd be somebody someday. It didn't happen the first Sunday I met her. It wasn't love at first sight. I don't even believe in that crap. Who knows that they want to marry someone the first time they set their eyes on them. The most that can happen is that you know you want to show them off, take them home, or wherever it is you take girls to, sleep with them, and then tell your friends all about it afterwards. Love is stronger than that. With love, you want to be with them, spend time with them, wake up with them, smile when they smile, and say something nice to make them stop when they cry. You want to hear their voice and buy them things and come at anyone that tries to make them sad. And that sh Oh, sorry. I shouldn't be using language like that in front of decent folk. What I was going to say is that feelings like that, they don't just sprout the first time you lock eyes. They grow. Love happens gradually, unexpectedly but slowly. Slowly, it gets seasoned with desire and the expectation of reciprocity at every contact. Slowly, you allow time for it to marinate. Feelings are like tender creatures. That's why you want them soaked in long phone calls and hours of conversations. That's why you want them forged in friendship and rooted in undeniable chemistry or whatever science it is that controls the heart and other parts of the human body that does tinini tinini and react in a certain kind of way when you're in the presence of that special somebody. We're still talking about feelings, right? Oh yes, we are. Feelings are watered by acts of kindness and shared values of what two people who really like each other can accomplish in the life that weighs them both. Feelings grow. They flutter and stumble. Sometimes they fall and almost give up. But they get back up and keep moving until they become this unfettered attraction and respect that morphs and mutates and multiplies until feelings they become love. True love. Okay, focus back to me. I fell in love with Kajima on the seventh Sunday after our first encounter. After that first Sunday, we sat beside each other in church. That first day, we didn't even look at each other. Not even when the pastor asked us to turn to the two people sitting to our right, left and right. Look them in the eye and say to them that we love them the Jesus way. Though she was dancing vigorously, I really didn't look at her during praise and worship. My full attention was on the flawless gyration of singed waist and extra curvy bottom in front of me. Growing up Catholic, it was my first time in a Pentecostal church, and so I wasn't prepared for the fervent distraction unleashed by this particular young woman who seemed oblivious of the many souls she mesmerized with her twirling, maybe even ushered into eternal damnation that morning because the man leading the church in songs kept screaming, In the presence of the Lord there is liberty. In the presence of the Lord there is freedom. The Bible says, there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. He kept on shouting at the top of his voice, Dance, dance, shake him, shake him. And that, my brothers and sisters, was all the encouragement this woman needed to suppress us. Eventually, I will turn and look at Inkajima. It was at the point in the service where the mummy of the church called for thight and offering as well as the mandatory contribution members made to the new building project being undertaken on the large expanse of land recently acquired by the church in Rumokrushi. When she passed me the plastic basket so I could drop my envelope 
Our eyes met. She smiled at me and I smiled back. I liked what I saw. She had such a pretty face and a charming smile, but nothing sparked that instant. Love didn't happen. People used to say all the time that the tall boy short girl dynamics work really well, but from my experience, that wasn't always the case. Short girls are controlling, especially the pretty ones that like everyone around them to know that they call the shots, no matter how tall the man was. That was why I avoided them. Inkejima would pass for short, easily. Inkejima and I didn't speak that Sunday. We spoke the next. We spoke because we sat beside each other again, and when the service was over, she offered to give my friends and I a ride home. I bet she overheard our conversation about wanting to join the free bus shuttle provided by the church. It was a Pentecostal church in Elekaya, and if you know Elekaya well, you might remember that there was only one Pentecostal church there in those days. So I won't mention names, you'll find out why in a little bit. Anyway, if you know anything about life in the 80s, you might know that it was unusual, maybe even a taboo for a young or married girl to drive, let alone own her own car. So we were impressed by the fact that it looked like it was her own car she took us to because a photocopy of the vehicle registration was taped to the top right hand corner of the windscreen. She told us she was going as far as presidential estate, but she offered to drive us further. She dropped us off at Waterlands Junction so we could join a taxi to D-Line where my friends and I had a shared apartment before driving back to presidential estate all by herself. My friends and I thought it was a very kind thing for her to do. We didn't speak much that day. She told us her name. We told her ours and that was it. But I would learn a little bit more about her the next Sunday. This time, I went to church alone, so I was the only one in the car with her. My friends had gone clubbing the night before and couldn't make it to Sunday service. Inkejima told me she worked in Shell Petroleum Development Company as an engineer. Her father got her the job. He was also an engineer and an SPDC retiree, while her mother was one of the biggest distributors of flour and soft drinks in the whole of River State. She told me her parents were serious born-again Christians that wouldn't let her rent her own place even though she could afford to because in their universe, good girls didn't live by themselves. Not only was it unsafe to do so, it would send the wrong message about her family, her background, and her upbringing to the community. In Kajima's Volkswagen Jetta was the compromise. Left with her parents, engineer and Mrs. Promise Elechi, it was fine if the family driver took her everywhere she went, which was basically work, church, and visiting the few friends she had. Enough about me, DK. It is DK, right? Yes, it is DK. DK Olanare. I remember that from last week when I gave you guys a ride. So what about you? We didn't get a chance to talk because of your friends. What do you do? I am a graduate of agricultural economics, but I'm actually an athlete, a sprinter specifically. I run the 100 and 200 meter races. Currently, I work with the River State Sports Council as a contract staff. As you can imagine, the pay isn't great and I haven't been fortunate to qualify for any major athletic event, so I don't travel much and people really don't know me. Did you mean like the Olympics? Yes the Olympics, World Championships, or even the National Sports Festival. And it isn't always about me not qualifying because I'm not a good runner. Sometimes the Nigerian factor comes in and the sports commissioner and directors in the ministry just fill up competition lists with names of their family members that aren't even athletes. I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm sure your time will come. There's nothing to be sorry about, it isn't your fault. I'm sorry if I'm being intrusive, but does it mean you don't get paid if you're not involved in any of these competitions you mentioned? You're not being intrusive at all. I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm not on the official payroll of the government, so sometimes things happen and we don't get paid or we are owed for months. So yes, not competing impacts on what I get paid at the end of the month. I have an elder brother who plays 
professional football in Europe though. He's struggling himself because he plays for a small club and he doesn't get paid much himself. But he's doing everything he can so I can join him over there sometime soon. Athletes are respected abroad, you know, and they're well taken care of too by their governments. I would like to leave this country someday. That has been my motivation to keep training and keep pushing myself every day until my time comes. Your time will come. Amen. In Kajima dropped me off at Water Lines. I started developing feelings that day. The next Sunday, she dropped me off at Water Lines again. And after that, we sort of became friends. We met for drinks a few times during the week and on Sundays, instead of heading straight to Water Lines Junction on Bonnie Street where I live, we would drive around town in her car and just talk. My feelings grew. When she gave me the keys to Ajeta five weeks later, I was already in love with her and she with me. She told me I could use it as Kabu Kabu when I wasn't working or training. At first, I was afraid. Why would she give me her car? DK, there's no need to be afraid. I'm not dashing you the car. With what the sports ministry pays you, that is if they pay you at all, do you think you'll ever be able to raise enough money to travel to Europe and pursue your dreams? Take the car and start saving the money you get from carrying passengers. When you have raised enough money to send to your brother and pay for everything you need, you can give it back to me. But your family, what would they say about me using your car? Don't worry about my parents. My dad was never in support of me buying it in the first place, so I know he'd be more than happy to let his driver take me everywhere I want to go. But he'd ask about it. And I'll tell him I've decided to put it on the road as a commercial vehicle. That would even make him happier. He'd call me a smart girl. And Kajima smiled. I accepted in Kajima's temporary gift of a car. I did as she said. And I started making money. I stayed in touch with my brother Fidel in Belgium. And everything was fine and going according to plan. In Kajima and I never used the word marriage in any of our conversations, but it was obvious I was in her future and she couldn't contemplate the future without me in it. By this time, it was obvious we were in love with each other and our relationship was unofficially official. I was happy and she was happy too. But soon enough, everything changed. Things changed when her parents found out that in Kajima and her taxi driver were in a relationship and it was my fault that they found out. In Kejima and I had known for a long time that her pastor was interested in her. And when he eventually informed her that God had spoken to him and that she was his wife, I just couldn't take it or imagine her being married to anyone else. I freaked out and did something I regret till this day. I drove straight to the church and begged him to leave her alone and look for someone else. That foolish move? It was the biggest mistake of my life. Pastor Wiwa Baribe probably informed the Kejima's parents about our secret relationship and they were furious. They were mad that their daughter lied to them and deceived everyone for such a long time about me and whatever it was we had going on. They were disappointed in her and insisted that if I was their daughter's choice for a future life partner, she was never going to get their blessing. The breakup was painful. What hurt the most was that I didn't get to see Kejima before leaving for Belgium. I was told that she got a job in Chevron and moved to Lagos. This was still in the 80s. There was no social media and mobile phones, so I couldn't verify this to be true. I didn't become the star athlete I dreamed of since I was a gangly teenager, but I got into sports administration and became really good at it. In 2009, my brother and I started a sports betting company and I moved back to Nigeria to run it since he was married and had all his family in Antwerp. I never married, although I had a daughter with a Belgian woman I lived with for 13 years before she left me for our daughter's dance teacher. In 2017, at my daughter and Nick's nudging, I reluctantly joined Facebook so I could see photos of her children whenever she posted them. From time to time, Facebook would send me suggestions of people I might know and like to follow. 
Most times I ignore the notifications. I would only look at them when I was extremely bored. Sometimes it was a direct friend request and I would ignore those as well because I wasn't on Facebook to socialize. I was surprised when I saw a friend request from Inkajima. Of course, I accepted because I was curious to know what she was up to and how life had treated her. I saw three children but no husband. However, I noticed that her name changed from Inkajima Elechi to Inkajima Balogu. So, something must have happened there. When we began chatting, she informed me before I could even ask that she lost her husband many years ago and never remarried. Her late husband was into manufacturing and so after his death, she resigned from Chevron to take up the role of chairman and managing director of his paper production company. We became online friends, but we connected in person after almost one year of texting and calling each other every day. It's funny, but after all these years, my heart still races whenever she calls and when we're together, I don't see a 61-year-old woman. I see the petite beauty of 24 I fell in love with many years ago. And come this Sunday, at the age of 63, for the first time in my life, I will be exchanging vows with the woman without whom I wouldn't be where I am today. The only woman I have loved. And the moral of this story, if there is one, is that true love never dies. Hi there, my name is Michael Afenthia and this is Right Out Loud. If you've enjoyed the story you just heard, please do well to like, share and subscribe to this YouTube channel. And I'll see you on the next one.